Good morning. Welcome to Fellowship Baptist Church Online. We're excited that you have joined us, and we've done everything that we can possibly do to make this time as beneficial for you as it possibly can be. Let me encourage you to interact with us throughout the service today. If you hear something you like, give us a thumbs up. If you hear something you love, give us a heart. If you want to say amen, uh, you just, just type it in there. Let's do whatever we have to do today uh, just to have church. Every Sunday morning, uh, we're going to begin the service with a video, an animated children's video. So I hope you have your kiddos gathered around and enjoy this video, and then we'll join Pastor Tyler and our musicians for a time of worship. Stories of the Bible, the triumphal entry. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like calming storms and even raised people from the dead. At this time, the Jewish people were celebrating a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses when God brought his people out of Egypt. So Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate. Jesus and his disciples stopped in the town. You coming? And Jesus told two of his disciples to go on ahead of them. Eh, okay. He told them to go into a village and that they would see a young donkey that no one had ever ridden. Rock! He told them to untie it and bring it to him. If anyone asks, what are you doing? He told them to just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. Okay, go ahead. So the disciples did what Jesus said and brought him the donkey. A long time ago, before Jesus was even born, God had said that the Savior, the King of Israel, would come to Israel in this way. And now Jesus was doing just as God had said. The news that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem swept through the city. Many heard about all the amazing things he had done, so they cut palm branches and ran to see him. Huh? The Pharisees and religious rulers realized that there was nothing they could do, for everyone was going to see Jesus. Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem and the crowd spread their coats on the road ahead of him. His followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. The Pharisees were upset. Hey, Jesus! and they told Jesus to stop the people from saying things like that. But Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into tears. So the people kept on singing, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered, asking, who is this? And the crowds replied, it's Jesus. And Jesus rode the donkey through the street of Jerusalem to the temple in a triumphal entry, just as God said he would many years before. Good morning, church. Wherever you're watching this from, I hope you'll join us in singing and in worship this morning. We're going to start with a familiar hymn, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His glory Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is. 
eyes to hear. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Sing the last. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Amen. Sing, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me. you this morning, but I'm thankful to be saved. I'm thankful to know the victory that I have in Christ Jesus. So thankful for that. This next song lifts him up. Jesus Messiah. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carry the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah the name of the
Jesus Messiah. Name above, name above all names. Blessed Redeemer, He met you well. Sing the rescue, the rescue for sin. Lord of all, Lord of all. And aren't you thankful that Jesus is Lord of all? The choir is going to sing now. We've got a recording that we took some time back. One of my favorite songs, the choir sings, taken straight from the book of Psalms, titled, Thou, O Lord.
Let's sing one more song of worship this morning. It's actually a prayer. A prayer that I think we should not only sing, but pray every day, especially during days like these. It says, Lord, I need you. Sing, Lord, I come. Lord, I come.
chapter 19 is where we'll be this morning. If you have your Bible handy, uh, grab it and to turn there, join me uh, in the 19th chapter of the book of Luke. Uh, Next week, of course, is Easter Sunday, and it will no doubt uh, go down as one for the record books in a number of ways. For me personally, uh, it'll be the first Easter since I got saved in 1976, Uh, that I'll not actually be in church. Uh, But even though we can't go out, we know that nothing could keep Jesus from coming out, and he's alive, and he's well in 2020, and we are excited about celebrating the resurrection of the Lord next Sunday. And church, let me me ask you to do this. I want you to flood Facebook with this image. Uh, Let's make sure that that we get as many people as possible uh, viewing our Easter Sunday live stream. I'm going to be reading this morning in verse 28, uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, and verse 28. And when he had thus spoken... He went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which, at your entering, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him. And bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto them, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. And they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, For all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Bless peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from 
among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should withhold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come nigh, or come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not live, or excuse me, they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. With the Lord's help, I want to preach to you today under this title, When the Cheering Stopped. He was known as the Hammer and was probably given the name because of his style of warfare. He attacked hard and fast. He was a seasoned warrior and because of his success against overwhelming odds, he was a hero to his fellow Israelis. At the time of his existence, Israel was an occupied country. The Syrians had conquered Jerusalem and plundered the temple, using its treasures to finance a war against Egypt. Later, they broke down the walls of the city, rendering it defenseless. About a year later, the Syrian leader outlawed the practice of Jewish religion. He ordered the scriptures destroyed. Religious holidays and ceremonies were no longer observed or practiced. The Syrians built a new altar on top of the old one they had destroyed. Then came the ultimate act of desecration. They sacrificed pigs upon the side of the holy altar in the temple. Although there were many Jews who obediently followed the dictates of the Syrians, there were others though they were few in number, who refused to do so. These brave but outnumbered zealots fled to the countryside where they found refuge in the villages. Before long, they had formed a resistance movement whose goal was to overthrow their Syrian oppressors. This small band of zealous Jewish patriots were led by the hammer. From their strongholds in the mountains, the hammer and his followers carried on a guerrilla campaign. Little by little, that small band of men grew, and as they grew, so did their attacks against the Syrians. It wasn't long before the resistance movement assumed the character of a holy war. Because of his knowledge of the countryside and the growth of his army, The hammer was able to defeat every Syrian detachment sent after him. Finally, after gaining control of the countryside, the hammer and his troops moved into Jerusalem. They pulled down the pagan altars, they cleansed the temple, and they made new altars. They set out incense and lights and offered a sacrifice. Then they celebrated for eight days. As part of their celebration, the hammer rode through the city on horseback as a victorious commander celebrating his success. As he rode, the people held out palm branches and waved them before him, singing and chanting. They did this for eight consecutive days. Then the people decided that this victory should be remembered each year with an eight-day celebration. This ongoing celebration was known as the Feast of Lights, or what we know today as Hanukkah. Although an important battle had been won, for the hammer and his followers, the war was far from over. These Jewish zealots and their leader continued 
their attempts to overthrow the Syrians and regain control of Jerusalem. To make a long story short, the Syrians called for help in the form of more troops. And when fresh troops arrived, they were able to overwhelm the Jewish resistance. And the Hammer's illustrious campaign came to an end just as it had begun on the field of battle. As we approach our text, it's some 200 years later, and now we see another man riding into Jerusalem, being greeted by waving palm branches. Like the hammer, this rider is riding into an occupied Israel. This time, however, the occupiers were not Syrians, but Romans. Their leader's name was Pontius Pilate. And like the leader of the Syrians, he antagonized the Jewish people, threatening to stamp out their religion. While there were some who had come to accept the Roman occupation, figuring that things could be a lot worse, there were still others who would readily welcome and willingly fight for someone who they thought could deliver them from the tyranny of Rome. Many thought Jesus was that man. After raising Lazarus from the dead, his popularity grew quickly. As he rode down the long hill from the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem, the waiting crowd shouted and chanted just like they had done for the hammer. Could it be that the hammer had returned? Could it be that the day of their liberation was at hand? Could it be that the Roman occupiers were about to be defeated? Thoughts just like these no doubt flooded the minds of these exuberant onlookers. And with uncontrollable excitement, they began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna means, O oh, save, or save us now. This must have been a remarkable sight. It is estimated that the number of Jews in Jerusalem that day numbered into the several millions. This was the time of the annual Passover observance. So those from throughout the entire nation would have been there. Here they were. Millions of Jews shouting and singing and welcoming the King of Israel. For years now, they had awaited the arrival of the one who would set them free from the rule of the Romans. And finally, it appears as though he had arrived. But in the midst of all of the excitement that day, something strange happened. The cheering stopped. The shouting ceased. All eyes were focused on Jesus as he suddenly stopped and began looking over the city of Jerusalem and at the multitudes who were singing his praises. And just a, after a, a few, few brief moments, the Bible says he began to weep. And in his weeping, he said this in verse 42, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. But now they are hid from thine eyes. As I read over this passage of Scripture this week, that phrase, if thou hadst known, really got a hold of my heart. I cannot help but think that Jesus, if he was affected at all, was affected very little 
by the shouts and cheers of the people. You see, his, his mind was not on reigning. It was on dying. He had not come as a revolutionary. He had come as a redeemer. His eyes were not on a throne. They were on a cross. He was not coming to be hailed as a conqueror, but to be nailed as a criminal. Jesus knew in his heart that many who were cheering for his coming would soon be calling for his crucifixion. He knew that shortly the shouts of Hosanna would be drowned out by the sounds of crucify him, crucify him. As he sat there overlooking the city of Jerusalem, Jesus could not help but say, if thou hadst known. I believe things would have been different had these Jews only knew the person they were praising. He was the Savior of their souls. And it's not like Jesus didn't make that clear during his public ministry with statements like this found in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. A couple of verses later in that same chapter, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I mentioned the raising of Lazarus a few minutes ago. That's found in John chapter 11. And in that discourse, Jesus said this, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then Jesus said this, in one of his public discourses in John chapter 5, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. How could anyone mistake who Jesus was? How could they think that there was any other way to be saved than through him? How could they deny that he was the Messiah after listening to him speak and witnessing the miracles he had performed? The blind had received their sight. The lame were made to walk. The dumb were able to speak again. The dead were made to live again. He turned water into wine. He fed a multitude with just five loaves of bread and two fishes. How could they mistake who he was? How could anyone mistake what he came to do? Not only was he the savior of their souls, but he was the sacrifice for their sins. John the Baptist made this perfectly clear when he saw Jesus and said to those standing near him, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John actually made this statement twice. Two times he declared Jesus publicly to be the Lamb of God. Those to whom John spoke would have understood perfectly his reference to the Lamb. The fact that someone or something had to die in order for sins to be covered was common knowledge to the Jewish people. This Lamb typology goes all the way back to the book of Genesis where God covered the sins of Adam and Eve. It continues in, in the story of Abraham 
and Isaac. As I mentioned, our text was taking place at the time of the Jewish Passover. We read about the Passover over in the book of of Exodus. It was a time of celebration that, that would have reminded the Jews yet again of the sacrifice of the Lamb. But in spite of all of their knowledge, the Jews of Jesus' day still did not recognize the person they were praising. Sadly, many today see Jesus as a good man, an enlightened teacher, a kind soul. They see him as many things, but not their Savior or their sacrifice. Not only did those of Jesus' day fail to recognize the person they were praising, but they failed to see the moment they were missing. Listen, they were within arm's length of eternal life. Their freedom, not political freedom, but spiritual freedom was within reach. Their salvation was in view. Jesus was in their midst, and they were letting him pass by. I'm reminded of the words of John chapter 1 and verse 11, where the Bible says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. What they didn't understand was that this would be their last chance to be saved. That's what Jesus said. That's what he meant in verse 42 when we read this, at least in this thy day. As Jesus sat there and overlooked the city of Jerusalem and and looked at those who who were praising him for something other than what he was, He said this was their day, their last day. He goes on in verse 22 and gives us the indication that soon their hearts would become so hardened and their spiritual eyes so darkened that there would be no desire whatsoever to turn to him. This was a moment of great opportunity, and they were missing it. How could that be? I submit to you that the reason these Jews were letting Jesus pass them by was because they were unaware of two things. Number one, they were unaware of the realness of their need. I mean, after all, these were Jews. They were God's chosen people. They were the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They were those that were said to be the apple of God's eye. I mean, what more could they need than that? I'll tell you what else they needed. They needed Jesus as their Savior. These Jews were relying on their religion. But ironically enough, it was their religion that blinded them from seeing their real need. Their need was not a need for religion. Their need was a need for a relationship. They were unaware of their need. And they were unaware of the seriousness of their neglect, which brings us to this final point. If they had only known the future they were facing. Look again at verses 43 and 44. For the days shall come upon thee 
that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Jesus told them plainly what was to come should they reject him as their savior. And it did come in February of AD 70 when Titus, a Roman general, surrounded Jerusalem with 80,000 men. What Titus and his men did was build a mound of dirt that encircled the entire city, which kept anyone from getting out, and it kept anyone from getting in. By the time all was said and done, history tells us that over one million Jews were destroyed. And sadly, they died in their unbelief and have been and will forever be separated from God. Let me make some application of all of this to our situation today. Although there were millions who were present the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem, they could all be divided into one of two groups. The saved and the lost. And the same is true today. Though there are a lot of people listening to me from different parts of the country with different backgrounds, different incomes, different stories, different life situations, you all fall into one of those two same categories. You're either saved or you're lost. If you're saved today, It's because there came a time in your life when you realized that you were a sinner, according to Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, which tells us that we've all sinned. And along with that realization, if you're saved, was this realization that what you deserved because of your sin was to be eternally separated from God in a real place called hell. Paul called it our wages in Romans 6.23. He said, for the wages of sin is death. But he goes on to say, in that same verse, For the wages of sin, or what we deserve because of our sin, is death or eternal separation from God. He follows that with this phrase, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Anyone who is saved is saved because they've accepted God's free gift. Of salvation. Now, there may be some listening who, like many in the crowd that day, as they saw Jesus riding into town, they believed that they were saved. And maybe you believe you're saved today because you're religious. But would you please listen to me? 
Going to heaven when you die, it's not about being religious. It's not about being baptized. It's not about partaking of communion. or It's not about being a Baptist or a Methodist or a Catholic or a Presbyterian. No, no, no. Listen to me. It's about knowing Jesus. Not knowing about Jesus, but knowing him personally as your Lord and Savior. If this pandemic, this thought crossed my mind this week as I was working on the message and giving thought to the message. This thought came to mind. If this pandemic has you worried because you've not been able to maintain your weekly religious ritual that you've been convinced you need to observe to stay saved, then perhaps this would be a good time to consider giving your heart to Jesus. And quit relying on your own good works and your own religious deeds to get to heaven. If you do not know Jesus, please do not let this moment pass you by. I'm not God, so I can't predict that this will be your last opportunity to be saved. But what if it is? Are you willing to take that risk in these uncertain days that we're living in right now? In a moment, I'm going to pray. And if you know you're lost, if there's never been a time in your life that you can look back to and say, that was the, that was the time, that was the place, that was, that was the moment that I received Christ as my Savior, then I want you to pray as I'm praying. And I want you to ask God to forgive you of your sin. And ask Jesus to be your Savior. Let's pray. Father, I come before you today. Lord, I'm thankful that Jesus is my Savior. I'm thankful for that day in 1976 when I received him into my life. And Lord, I'm thankful for the assurance of my salvation that he has given me through all of these years. And though I have failed him many, many times, I know he's never failed me, not even one time. And he has forgiven me over and over again. God, I pray today for anyone who may have been listening to us today or may listen to this later in the week, God, if they have never established a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray that they would reach out to maybe a friend or a family member or or a, a, a ministry member of a Fellowship Baptist Church and give us the opportunity to show them more clearly and more plainly from the scriptures how they can be born again. God, use what we've preached today and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you again for being with us uh, for our online service. It looks like we're going to be meeting this way. 
uh, for some time to come. And so as I said earlier, we're going to do our best to make it as beneficial to you and your family, your friends, uh, as we possibly can. Of course, this is the time that we would normally be receiving our offering if we were meeting together. Uh, But though we're not together, you can still give, and we certainly encourage you to give. Many of you have been so incredibly faithful over the last several weeks to give, and I'm thankful for that, and and, um, it's a blessing, and God will bless you for that. Even in the midst of a pandemic, uh, we still have an obligation uh, of obedience in our stewardship to the Lord. There are a number of ways you can give. You can, the easiest way would be to give electronically. You can go to our website, fellowshipfamily.org, forward slash give. And if you haven't yet uh, set up a profile online to give electronically, you can do that. Uh, of course, if you have, then you're probably already giving electronically, and we would encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, if you wish to give through the envelope system, uh, we're still good with that, and there are a number of ways that, uh, that you can do that. Right now, uh, we are preparing a mailing that uh, will include some offering envelopes and some self-addressed stamped uh, envelopes that you can mail uh, your offering into the church, and uh, those, those should be arriving in your mailbox sometime uh, this next week. Um, if, you, if you desire, you can drop your offering off here at the church, or uh, you can drop it off at the home of, of one of our ministry staff, or if you don't want to get out, and, and we certainly understand that, uh, just give us a call, let us know, and we'll be glad to come by and pick that up for you. And then for those who uh, may have joined us today, um, but you're not a part of the fellowship family, uh, maybe you just uh, got online to check out what Fellowship Baptist Church is about, maybe you're curious, listen, there should be a link on your screen right there. Um, And if you'll click that, it is a digital connection card. And again, like our offering, we normally receive this uh, while we're here, but obviously we're not meeting together. And so I would encourage you, if you're a, especially if you're a member of of Liberal or or one of the communities that surround Liberal, um, fill that out. Just put as much information as you feel comfortable putting on there and uh, send that to us. And, and that'll do two things. Number one, it'll let us know who joined us today. And beyond that, for every connection card that we receive throughout the month of April, Fellowship Baptist Church is going to be donating $10 to the Grace Place Pregnancy Care Center. Uh, these folks offer compassion, hope, and help to anyone who's facing an unplanned pregnancy by presenting them with practical alternatives and Christ-centered support. And so would you help us help them? Click that link, fill out that uh, connection card, and that would be a huge blessing. And also, while you're on the connection card, if you made some kind of spiritual decision today, would you let us know that? If you have a prayer request, Let us know that as well. We want to do everything we can to be a help and a blessing to you. And now, I want to encourage you also to join us again tonight at 6 o'clock, not 6.30, but at 6 o'clock for our evening service. Pastor Tyler will be continuing his preaching series through the book of 1 Thessalonians, and I know that you will be blessed by that. Thank you again for being with us today. Have a blessed week. Good morning, and thanks for joining us online this Sunday. I know all of us miss meeting together in person, but I'm so thankful that you're a committed church, that you're willing to tune in to services from your living rooms, from your phones, from other devices. 
And so what I want to do is actually remind you of our live stream schedule that we're going to follow the next couple of weeks until the shelter in place order is removed. Uh, we'll be streaming every Sunday at 10 a.m. and then also on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. And then Wednesday services will actually take place at the normal time of 7 p.m. And what's amazing to me is that even among these circumstances, our church hasn't stopped being generous like it always has been. I mean, we have people like uh, Dwayne Develin and Mark West who've been sending a cleaning crew to deep clean the auditorium and the chairs for when we get back. People like Al Sill who've been working on restriping the parking lot. And then not only that, we've had reports of church members being generous to different organizations in the community. And church, I wanna thank you so much for showing the love of Christ during this time. And speaking of liberal love, we're excited to announce that we are doing another liberal love activity this Thursday night. And we're gonna give away 300 free pizzas to our community. We'll be distributing about 25 of those pizzas to different first responders in our community. And then we're gonna be giving away about 275 to the first people who drive up to our parking lot on Thursday night between five and 6.30 p.m. And if it's like last time, uh, we may end a little bit before that. And we're so thankful for the members of our church as well as some members in our community even who've donated to allow us to give away even more pizzas uh, to be a blessing to our community. And really it's because of your generosity as a church that we can reach out and bless people during a really difficult time. And so uh, right after you hop off the live stream, be sure to share our post on Facebook and help us get the word out as we give away 275 free pizzas this Thursday night. Now with all the news centered around the coronavirus, it could actually be really easy to forget that Easter Sunday is next week. And as Pastor mentioned on Wednesday, this Easter could very well be our opportunity as a church to reach even more people with the gospel than ever before through our online service. And church, I wanna encourage you to help us reach out to our community by doing four simple things in the next week that really I think will allow us to reach more people with the gospel online. Most of these you can do if you don't have a Facebook account, but feel free to adapt them however feels best. Number one, I wanna encourage you to share our Easter Sunday post on Facebook. Share it and then maybe even personally write a message to your friends on Facebook to tune in and watch the service with you. And number two, if you have a Facebook, you'll see that you can now add our Facebook profile picture frame to your photo. This is a really simple but powerful way to just spread the word in our community uh, for them to tune into our Easter services next Sunday at 10 a.m. And the next one is probably the most important. And I wanna challenge you to personally Facebook message or text or even call two people and invite them to watch our Easter service. Uh, sometimes, you know this, all it takes is a personal invitation for someone to be willing to attend Easter online with you. And here's the last one. I wanna challenge you to leave a review on our Facebook and our Google accounts. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the boring details, but this actually allows our church to have a stronger online presence so we can meet, reach more people with the gospel, not just for Easter, but even in the weeks and months to come. And it takes just a minute for you to write a thoughtful review of why you love our church. And that's it. I really believe that if all of us did those four things, it could result in dozens more people watching our Easter online service and hearing the gospel. So church, I hope you'll be intentional to do that. And really that's all the announcements for today. Church, thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.